survival expert, Cody London. We are absolutely thrilled to have him here. Hi, Cody. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, Kim. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do? Yeah, what I do is I teach modern survival skills, primitive living skills, urban preparedness, and even get into some homesteading, um, which they're all very different uh, formats of self-reliance. I started my company in 1991 um, in and around Prescott, Arizona. And so those are the the four main genres of self-reliance that I cover. And most of this is in hands-on courses out in the field or at my homestead. Cool. And you know what? I I mean, I was on your website. You have an incredible website, uh, www.codylondon, so it's L-U-N-D-I-N.com. And you can take classes. You've got books. You've got just a plethora of media events you've attended. How did this all get started for you? It got started by just having a personal passion in the late 1980s is when I first formally started teaching and then I had a, a, a girlfriend years ago that I put out a, basically an, an, an ad to the summer camps. Prescott, Arizona has a lot of different summer camps for kids. And I wrote every one of them, excuse me, about 20 of them and said, hey, uh, my name is Cody. Here's what I do. I can teach primitive skills or survival skills to the kids. And no one gave a damn. I didn't get one response out of like 20 letters. And she said, basically, stop your bitching. And she had a graphic designer friend in, in San Francisco and they made me a free flyer. And uh, keep in mind, this was, you know, 1990 or so. <laughs> and I hung those around town on telephone poles and on store windows, which sometimes I still do. I'll, I don't do the telephone poles anymore. That's how it started. So basically, uh, no one else would hire me. And so I went self-employed uh, with my with my company. And that's literally how it started. It was very piecemeal. It's taken many, many, many years but over the years, that's why you see all that media. It's been over two decades. Wow, that's 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 amazing. You know, it's, leave it to girlfriends to tell you what to do, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> get you get you straight. So, so you're saying that you basically, you know, when you you started out in this business, like no one really wanted to have anything to do with you. You had to really, you know, rough it out and tough it out. It, that's true. I mean, now if it, the self reliance thing is hot, I mean, if you if you really think about the context of what was going on here. There were no cell phones for civilians. You know, email was just starting to maybe happen. And and pretty much everything was a written brochure, you know, or flyer or whatever. There was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. And that's what a lot of people exploit now. And it's unfortunate in a way because you can look like a badass with this um, uh, social media and really not have the background experience at all. But you can appear like you do. So this was a piecemeal, uh, I love what I do. So it's not like it was a, a really a chore to do this. I mean, both of you, if you're following your passion, you know it's never worked to follow your passion. But it does take time to get established because what I do for a living involves whether you live or die in the wilderness. So it's a, it's a, mm-hmm. a profession I take very, very seriously. Um, but it, for me, that's how it happened. It was a long road. It wasn't hip. You know, there weren't any television shows really on survival, and no one really gave a damn except a few people that took courses. There were schools before me, uh, by no means the first, but it's nowhere near the craze, you know, that happened in Y2K and with 9-11, et cetera. Yeah, well, I can can tell you that uh, you're definitely someone I would uh, want to be stuck out in the wilderness with. There's no doubt about that. (laughs) Are Are you asking me out? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? I, I, if I were going to be stuck someplace, I, 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 I wouldn't mind being stuck with you because I've seen some of the things that you do, and you know, um, and it's just incredible. Uh, and, and, and you do have a passion for what you do. Um, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, I, I saw a video of you uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, you were you were out in uh, I think it was South Africa and you fell into the water with a bunch of sharks and I was like are you kidding me There's absolutely no way I would do that I would I would freak out and panic and I'm oh, you know I'm you know what actually, Garth actually called me after watching that video clip and said his heart was racing he's like my heart is actually racing after watching that clip and he he emailed it to me and said you got to watch this clip it is scary as hell well you know you need to remember that production is production and yeah we do some sketchy stuff for sure but that's not what you'd want to do for real. 
you know, you don't want to push the envelope. You don't want to be reckless and dangerous if you're in an actual survival situation for obvious mm-hmm. reasons. So I'm ver- I'm fairly conservative with what I do because it's my job to be conservative with people in the field because I teach real people real skills, you know, to handle real situations. And so, you know, media does their thing, and God knows I've seen a lot of media. But, you know, my main passion is dealing, you know, with real people that, that really want to know the skills that might get compromised, that might get lost on a simple day hike, or we might have that next tornado or whatever it might be that mm-hmm. knocks out the grid or, or knocks out them in the field carrying their backpack. And that's really, you know, uh, what it's all about for me. Yeah, like, you know, because I, I also saw another video clip of you where you actually took a, a, a news report to a supermarket. And I was actually, you know, when you picked up the can of tuna, uh, and the guy said, "What about can opener?" And he's like, "Oh no, you don't. You don't need a can opener. I'm going to show you how to open it." And you actually rubbed it against um, some concrete, and you know the lid came right off. I, I, I would have never thought of that. Yeah, it's uh, that's the way those cans are made. And that was in 2006, and that was a book tour when I was in Seattle, Washington, for my second book, "When All Hell Breaks Loose: Stuff You Need to Survive When Disaster Strikes." And that mm-hmm. this is what I'm talking about. Is Seattle because they're in such a frankly, a dangerous geographic location, you know, with the ring of fire, et cetera. They have a lot of factors that they need to contend with up there. They're very hip on disaster preparedness. Uh, Seattle and Portland, that whole northwest coast area is light years ahead of the rest of America as far as common sense preparation skills, you know, to deal with the calamities that might befall where they're living. So it was a lot of fun, of course, to be around people that don't just look at you as some some freak, but they actually care about what what you're talking about. And I I pitched to that guy, look, man, let's do this campy. Let's make it a lot of a lot of fun. Let's make it funny because that that is what engages people's attention. When you talk about scary subjects, if you're doom and gloom and too matter of fact, it turns people off. You know, because a lot mm-hmm. of people don't want to think about any sort of disasters. So they went with that, and the editors were cool with that, and so it turns out campy, um, which I love. Yeah, yeah. well, we learned that the hard way, too. You know, um, you know, we, we've done some other events, and um, we realized that, that people just don't want to sit and listen to, you know, a, a boring lecture. They want to be engaged, and they want to have a lot of fun in doing what they're doing. So, we, you know, it's something we've experienced personally, Kim and I. Yeah, and we've, we, we've reinvented ourselves at least five times over the last six months, and I think we finally got the right combination because things are just exploding for us. And But it took perseverance, and that's one of the reasons we really wanted to interview you is because after reading your bio, we felt you were a lot like we're on the trail that you were on. I mean, we started with nothing, and we're just been building, 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 and, you know, where there's a roadblock, we tear it down, and we just keep going. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what needs to be done nowadays, you know. I mean, uh, but nowadays you have, you know, like I said, you have these wonderful tools that can be used for good or bad. You know, like we've talked about, I mean, the Internet for one, and, I mean, it sounds uh, cryptic and, you know, but your younger listeners might be going, what the hell is this guy talking about, the Internet? And, you know, you, hasn't YouTube always been around? And the answer is, hell no. You know, mm-hmm. so there is, a, there is a bunch of different tools that can be used now. Uh, I don't exploit them very well. Uh, frankly, I'm too damn uh, outside, but there's a lot of tools for people to use nowadays. Yeah, so you probably don't suffer from that that, that uh, um, what's that withdrawal syndrome that people have when they're not able to uh, send an email or check their Facebook or or just surf the web. That that doesn't even bother you or phase you at all. No, I mean the, the, I, I I'm on the computer a lot when I write a book, of course, and I have to engage with my clients. But no, it's like it's not. Uh, we're in for a world of hurt, you know, if the power grid ever goes down, because you'll have basically a bunch of people that are used to having that pacifier, you know, stuck right up you know where. And frankly, mm-hmm. you know, seeing as how survival situations are 90% psychology, it is a drug. There's no question that social media uh, is a drug. You know, it can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And are, are there a lot of addicts out there? Hell yes, there are a lot of addicts. You mm-hmm. know, so I, I recommend that you, we all need to wean ourselves from this and, frankly, get some reality, maybe go outside every once in a while, maybe spend time with your kids or your pets or do something other than be on the computer. As wonderful as it is, you know, it, it's just, it, it, you know, they've done documentaries on this, they've done books on this, you know, there's a movie coming out about, you know, some woman putting out a little snippet of 
a foreign, some innocent teenager, and it takes down an entire family. So there's no question it's a big, nasty machine. Um, it depends on how it's used. That's right. Mm-hmm. Interesting. There's so many questions that I want to ask you, but one of them that I was dying to ask you is, reading through your bio and stuff, you talk about when you were in the desert for two years, and I'm sort of interested in like, how that took place, like how you just ended in the desert for two years, and then you talk about a significant happening that happened to you while you were in the desert, but you didn't really elaborate on it on your website. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that or if that's in the book or if that's something you can share with us. <clears throat> yeah, it was in the, in the pine forest, and I lived in the woods for two years in a brush shelter. It's called the wiki up, but I was engaging with people. So I would live in my bus shelter, and then I would go into town, and I would work stained glass, and I was actually going to a four-year college at the time. So I'd ride my mountain bike in town, do all my classes and coursework, work a part day at stained glass to get money, and then ride my mountain bike back out to the woods, crawl back in my bus shelter, and eat my top ramen on my pine needle bed over an open fire. So basically I was living in two different distinct worlds, but I did not go out and isolate, you know, at all. And uh, so that was one part of my life when I was in college. What you're referring to before was um, I was busted for drugs when I was a teenager, and I did a lot of jail time and was looking at 30 years in prison when I was a teenager, and that got whittled down through plea bargaining and stuff to 11 years, and I was sentenced to 3 to 8, and they suspended that because I was so young, and I did my months in county, and I did my months in rehab. And when I was in rehab is when I was in Sedona, Arizona. And I always loved the outdoors. I'm an only kid. I'm a military brat, so I moved around a lot. So nature was pretty much my constant companion. And uh, if you've been to Sedona, Arizona, it's awesome. You know, it is some of the most beautiful red rock formations in North America. And we had this guy that used to take us on day hikes as part of our little therapy package. And I just had this experience. Um, it's hard to put into words, so I won't. Um, but I never went back after that. It was like I was blown open <clears throat> by whatever situation was happening to me. And I, I, that's when I made the call that I'm not leaving this again. I'm not, I'm, I will be in nature. I will share nature with other people. And this is somehow I want to do this as a lifestyle. You know, I want to incorporate this in my life, and I want to share what it does to me uh, with others, because there are a lot of Hoods in the Woods programs that take troubled youth out in the field and use that metaphor of, of nature to whip them into shape. And a lot of them are very successful because you can't rebel against Mother Nature. You know, she'll let you kick and scream and piss your pants all you want and just go, screw you. You know, it's, you, you need to be self-directed and motivated to survive out in the backcountry or you will die. So she's a great teacher because you can't throw a tantrum, you know, and so those were two very distinct, different experiences in my life that, of course, uh, are a big part of who I am. Oh, absolutely. What would you say is the biggest challenge you overcame? Was it the drugs? Oh, there's no question that drugs and alcohol abuse, and I was both. I mean, how many people do you know that that's killed? You know, they've killed several of my friends, and it's a huge killer, you know, on, on this, on, all over this nation. So addictions of any sort, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, or whatever, in this in this case, it was drugs and alcohol, uh, sure. I was definitely, uh, it was killing me. There's no question about that. And I don't know if I'd be here doing this interview had I not got busted, you know. And it wasn't that, uh, it was a few people in rehab that it was, my, my therapist's name was Dick. And Dick had never done drugs. So you can imagine what I thought about Dick when I talked to Dick, because I was like, hey, Dick, you've never done drugs. So what are you going to tell me about being an addict? But it was other people that I respected, a woman that was a heroin addict, other people that I wanted what they had. You know, they were centered. They were they were calm. Uh, they, they had some essence about them as a person that intrigued this ratty little teenager who was all strung out. And, I, you know, I am a firm believer that she will not give up any sort of addiction until you replace it with something better. And in this case, whatever they had was better than what I had. And it's been a hell of a long road, you know. And it's not that I uh, think about a beer at all. I haven't in years and years and years and years. That's not the issue. The issue is anyone who's not happy with their life, there's, there's always something better to replace that with, and that's the motivation to do it. 
Yeah, I, 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 I totally relate to to everything you just said because I had some similar experience when I was a young, a young, uh, young man uh, in my life, and uh, you, you know, you hit a bottom, and those circumstances cause you to take a look at your life, and and you see people who who have that serenity, and you and you want what they have. And, uh, you know, when you go out and you get it, you realize that uh, there's more to life than just living, you know, for the drugs or, or, or for the bottle or whatever it is that you're living for. So I, I, I totally relate to that. Um, it, it's an experience that um, a lot of people don't have, the, the I guess, the 12-step programs or even programs of like-minded people that to support them. And, and there are a lot of challenging people out there with a lot of problems in life and it may not just be, you know, drugs and alcohol is the, sometimes the most obvious thing, but there's eating, there's shopping, there's stealing, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on that, that you can become addicted to, not just Facebook. <laughs> there's a whole lot of other things. But I had a question for you. You know, well, you know, when you lived out in the, in, 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 in the, in the forest, I mean, what was, what was that like? Would you have considered yourself uh, homeless at that point, or would you have considered yourself uh, just living in the forest? <clears throat> Uh, the forest was my home, you know, and I mm-hmm. built a brush shelter. So I did have a home um, with a pine needle bed and a, and a fire pit in the middle and a little willow door that I wove with an army blanket hanging in the doorway and two stones for a porch and a flat rock with two candles that I used to study and do my homework on. So, mm-hmm. you know, I had a full-on home, so I didn't consider myself homeless at all because I had pretty much everything I needed. Yeah, it reminds me, you know, uh, I think it was last year I was, I was on my way to church, and I stopped uh, on the way to church to pick up this, this, this guy who had a sign-up. You know, he was looking for a ride. And so I picked him up and, and gave him a ride, and he said he had come all the way from Massachusetts, and he was on his way to Michigan. And he was probably in his early 20s. And, um, you know, in that conversation, um, there was one thing that he said that I thought was pretty profound. I said to him, you know, am I being naive? I said to him, so what's it like being homeless? And he says, you know, uh, I'm not homeless. Uh, just because I don't own a house doesn't mean I'm homeless. You know, the world is my home. You know, I, I, I live in the forest. And it, it was really a great metaphor for me because it totally gave me a different perspective. You know, in our culture, in our society, people believe that if you don't have certain things, that then you don't meet the criteria. And this young man showed me that, you know, just because I don't own a house or I don't live here, in a, in a particular place doesn't mean I'm homeless. That uh, I'm actually living my life and I'm having fun, and my fault is proud of me. I thought it was pretty, uh, pretty cool experience. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I did it, you know. So yeah. I, I, I mean, he's just I did it before he was born. <laughs> so a lot of people before me has, has, have done it, and 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 we all grew up doing it. Our ancestors all had homes. They just didn't look like conventional stick stick, uh, stick homes that were. Uh, illegally financed by a subprime mortgage scam that now we're all really homeless, you know. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it would all be better if we all lived in a brush shelter because then we could stick the 30-year mortgage right up someone's ass. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say is like a core gene that people have in them that makes them a survivor? I mean, is there any one thing that you can pinpoint that – because, you know, you'll see like you'll watch these shows and like two people will be stuck on a mountaintop and they're like the same age, the same – you know, um, athletic build, one can survive and one dies. And you, I often, to me, I will it to your love of life and your will to live, but do you think there's something more? Do you think there's some gene inside somebody that makes them an ultra survivor? I think that some people are inherently born with more of what you'd call the will to live or a party on attitude. I think that can be trained into someone as well. I've always said for years and years and years that survival is 90% psychology. You know, it's it's not really the gadgets. People focus on gadgets and gear and whatever, and God bless them. But, you know, it doesn't matter what you have buried in your backyard if you're too stupid, scared stupid to use it. So what what makes a person rise to the top and what makes a person sink, I don't know. And I've read a lot of survival stories. One commonality that is in a lot of survival stories is the survivor in the moment <clears throat> thinking about their family. So here we have something that's dearly loved, that will be dearly missed. And many, many, many people in the stories I've read have said, you know, well, it's, it's I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to see my mom again, or I can't die now because what will my kids do? And it was that mental and emotional motivation that really pulled them through. And as, as we all know, if, if you can read between the lines, 
someone's psychology directly affects their physiology and vice versa. So the will to live, as cheap as it sounds, is a very powerful force that I think is largely understood in the human psyche about getting people through very, very trying situations. And a lot of people use the love of family to do that. Interesting. I never even thought yeah. of that aspect of it. Yeah, I know one of the sayings out there is, you know, we'll do more for others than we'll ever do for ourselves. And, uh, you know, when we think of people that we love, um, I guess that that brings that will to want to survive out in you, you know, especially when you're facing a, an adverse situation. Well, there's a, there's a friend of mine that teaches self-defense, and, of course, he has a lot of women clients. And when he tries to get into their head to, to uh, do their training, he might say to a woman, um, you know, here's what you need to do to your attacker, and the woman will go, oh, I could never do that. You know, I, could, I, could, I don't know if I could do that. And then my friend will say, what would you do if this person was attacking your child? And the woman will say, I'll kill him. <laughs> you know, so again, it's that drive of family. You don't mess with a woman's kid I because would, you're mm-hmm. messing with a grizzly bear. And yet would, that woman might not defend herself, but if you screw with her kid, all bets are off. And that motivation, that drive, that, you know, eventually, in, in this case, it comes to self-worth, unfortunately, in a lot of cases. But it's very potent, and it's saved a lot of lives. I was just going to say that. I am that exact way. Like, I am by no means, like, Miss Brave and, you know. But I'll tell you what, when I got my kids in tow, I am, like, a different woman. And I I would take on King Kong himself. <laughs> it wouldn't bother me. And it is just... And, you know, it just never dawned on me that maybe that's what it, what the difference is when one survives and one d- doesn't. Maybe they have family that they're surviving for. So I think that's fascinating. It is fascinating. I have to ask you a little bit more about your Aborigine living school. Tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, how, you spend like a week in the, in, in the outdoors training people, or is it a three-day class, and what does it all entail? Yeah, um, my Aboriginal Living Skills School, like I mentioned, I've been, I've had since 1991, and I chose the word Aboriginal because it means Indigenous or first. You know, it doesn't mean it doesn't have anything to do with the Australian Aborigines. That's a totally separate word. So you could be Aboriginal French, Aboriginal German, Aboriginal Italian, etc. And what I do, uh, like I referenced, is I have field courses, and I also do lectures and consulting, etc. But m- what my field courses are is they're out in the field. You know, so I have one starting tomorrow. So my, I'll have clients that show up from all over the nation tomorrow, and we'll meet, and we'll get in the van, and we'll go out, and we'll hike out into the wilderness. And in this particular course, we'll do handrail fire with sticks. We'll make throwing sticks for small game. We'll do deadfall traps and snares. We'll do gourd canteens, and we'll talk about wild edible plants. It's more of a food gathering course. It's advanced primitive skills. And a lot of it, of course, is hands-on, and they'll come back with a canteen and a throwing stick and a hand drill set, et cetera, along with knowledge of, of both flora and fauna. So that's what I mostly do. You know, when someone comes to me for a course, they want a hands-on course. And my, a lot of my courses are in real wilderness, and I have some that are very aggressive that might cover 40 miles in, in the back country over a period of a week. Two, week, two days, one week to nine days is my typical format. I have taught college courses that were a month long before. Uh, in the early 90s, I started doing that. So it's kind of all over the map, to, you know, depending on the client. I have a client that I'm going back for the second time in Arkansas, um, a wealthier man, and, and, and I'm going to pimp out his homestead. We trained on his land doing modern survival skills and primitive skills, and now he has a home out there, and he wants to make it into a, basically a retreat, a homestead retreat. So we'll do that and we'll do more primitive skills and modern skills to get him up to speed with this self-reliant homestead that he wants. Uh, that's interesting. I, I, got, I actually have a, 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 it's a two-part question. Um, you know, you know with, with your school, I'm sure people come in, and on day one or the first hour, they have this belief system or they have this attitude. Um, they're dealing with fears or whatever anxiety they're feeling. You know, what is the most common thing? And then the second part of the question is, uh, you know, after the, the 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 class is over and you've spent a week out in the wilderness or three days, what is the biggest transformation that you see uh, with your students? Well, it depends on the course. You know, I mean, if, if we do a very evolved course in the backcountry, um, the, the transformation can be uh, very profound. You know, people have come back and they've emailed me later, 
uh, hey, Cody, I quit my job, and uh, by the way, I got married, or by the way, I got divorced. I've had <clears throat> several people come to me over the years who want to kind of, um, to, they're shaking something off psychologically. They want to use the physical skills as a metaphor to get into their head and kind of clean things out. And the desert, the high desert especially, is great for doing that. Um, you know, other people just go back with a bunch of blisters and a big smile, you know, because they <laughs> they just wanted the adventure from a physical standpoint for learning physical skills, and they didn't care about the psychological aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Now, earlier you talked about when you first started getting going on this, you did flyers and stuff, and you tried to get into these kids' camps. Do you do anything with kids, and is that something that you might consider doing down the road? Um, I've worked a lot with kids. I, I've worked, you know, uh, Boy Scouts. I've worked with Native American youth. I've worked with the library grant programs. Um, I've done a lot of that mostly in the past. I've had a lot of courses recently with families, you know, where the dad will show up with the kid. And I, the last one I did, there was three families there, you know, that brought their boy or brought their two boys or girls or whatever it was. I prefer working, I love working with kids, but my forte and, and my preference is adults because I'm 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 very serious about my training and usually the adults are a lot more serious than a nine-year-old is going to be. Although I have seen 12-year-olds that outpace the, nine, uh, that outpace the adults. But because I'm so busy and, and, and my schedule is crammed, typically I'll stick with the adults. And have you ever been in a survival situation out in the wild that it did get sketchy and you were like, wow, I don't know if I'm going get, to get out of this? Have you ever had a moment like that? I've had some scary times with students years ago, um, but it, it wasn't. I was. I wasn't sure they were going to make it. It was a food poisoning incident. It was very, very bad. I was in 1994. Um, I knew I was going to make it, but if I had lost a student on this particular trip, um, I would have quit. I would have done something else as a profession. So, uh, you know, it was. So I, of course, I mean, when you take people out and push the envelope for 20 plus years shit happens, you know. But have I lost anyone? No. Have other schools lost people? Yes. Really? You know, but I'm I'm riding the lightning on that. And that's why people come to me is my experience. And that's why it's so important that you get beyond the Facebook and the YouTube and all the BS that's out there and really look into someone's credibility and see how long have they been doing this. Because I know several people that claim they have this many years of experience and they're lies. They're not, it's not true. If a physician did that, if you have a three-year physician that claimed they had 20 years, they'd be in jail. But, of course, there's no oversight in my profession, even though it still deals with human life. It's very strange. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. No, so I do have to ask you, how did you know Dave Canterbury before you started doing the show with him on Discovery, or did you just meet him through the show? No, I'd never heard of Dave before, and I met him for the first time at the chemistry tests that Discovery did, and I went through 11 soldiers, 11 military personnel, and he was one of those 11. Really? And so on the show, you guys look like you guys are really good friends. Are you guys really good friends off the show and in real life? <laughs> we don't we don't hang out. I mean, Dave's in Ohio doing his thing, and I'm here. Uh, I've been booked. This is my This is my season. Like I said, I have a course starting tomorrow, so it's not like I have a lot of time uh, for for any farting around at all because I am uh, I'm just busy doing skills. I have a you know illustrate or uh, excuse me a, a agent in New York City literary agent. He's been waiting on me for two years for my next book and I which I haven't had time to even submit to him in a proposal. So I don't have a lot of time to 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 do visiting. So I pretty much stick to to doing what I've been doing for a long time. Yeah, and and, and you've been doing it for over twenty years. Yeah, I formally started in 91, but you don't just start a business in outdoor survival skills and not have any experience before you start. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I started in the late 1980s, and I've always had an interest. I was the kid in high school that would pick up roadkill and make cool stuff and do do, uh, book reports on Native American stuff in high school, and and I've I've always loved, you know, nature. Do you have any Native American heritage in your family? Not that I know of. I mean, both my families are from South Dakota. Uh, I just recently found out, I need to call them today, actually, 
uh, there's a Homestead uh, National Monument, and I do come from real, honest-to-God homesteaders, and they've checked it out with the Freedom of Information Act and government documents, and they want to do a flag of me, along with Whoopi Goldberg and Jewel and a couple other so-called famous people that really did come from homesteaders through the Homestead Act of, of the 1860s, and and that'll be happening soon. And that was big time Native American country. And my grandparents actually did hide Native American people that were wanted for this or that or whatnot because they felt bad for them. Do I do I think I have any Native American blood in me? I don't think so. But I have a lot of Viking blood and Czechoslovakian blood. And mm-hmm. so, you know, we wore our hair this way too. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Well, you know, I, I have a, a, another question for you, and I think, you know, congratulations, and that's awesome um, that you have that opportunity. Um, how do you want to be remembered? You know, when 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 time is done and you know the clock stops, how do you want to re- be remembered uh, by by the world and your friends? Someone who had integrity and someone who had the passion to follow their heart and didn't buy anyone's BS and serve the light as much as possible. Oh, I think you definitely will nail all of those. What's next for you, Cody? I mean, I know you're going to keep going and doing what you're doing. Is there anything exciting on the horizon that's different than what we all know about you already? Oh yeah, I mean, there'll be an, uh, eventually. I'll get time to do another book, and and I'm always, you know, building on my homestead. And to me, it's just nonstop excitement because I I I am my lifestyle. My, my profession is my lifestyle. Books. Who knows about television? Uh, lots more courses, and, and you know, who knows what's coming down the pike? That's a good question. Is, is there is there a Mrs. Cody survival partner? Yeah, I do have a sweetie, and she's way into the outdoors, and and I don't require that, you know. So mm-hmm. I've gone out, gone out with women with high heels and heavy makeup before. You know, <laughs> if they if they dig the outdoor caveman type, so be it. it doesn't take a a hippie girl to dig that. So, mm-hmm. but, but yeah, I'm with an outdoor woman for sure. Yeah, excellent. Cool. Well, I had to ask that question. You know, I couldn't help it. Yeah, well, <laughs> I does understand. That, does she do the outdoor survival with you then? What's that? Does she do the survival with you? I mean, does she go out into the outback for a week at a time? And um, yeah, when she can. I mean, she works at a gallery in town, and you know, we do whatever trips we can. But basically, you know, she's uh, um, we go out when she we can. You know, I don't take her out with my clients because that's not appropriate. So, you know, and, and her sister's actually getting married this weekend, so obviously she's not coming out on this course. But usually my schedule is so busy right now that I don't have a lot of time um, for a lot of free time. So we see each other when we can, and usually I'm just, I'm out. I'm out in the field. I mean, how long have we been talking about this interview? Weeks yeah. and weeks and weeks been trying to set up this interview, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, you are a busy guy, so I really do appreciate you taking the time. Talking we really to do, me. and uh, I, 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 you know, I, 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 like I said, you know, the, you know, what I've seen of you, um, I, I've, I've been very impressed, and like I said in the beginning, I, if I, if I were ever going to be stuck somewhere, I, I would want to be stuck with you. <laughs> well, thank you. Do, you. do you know, um, Cody, that DL actually said to me, he said, you know, what would be awesome to do a survival, and because. Garth is in New York, and he said, would be a survival in New York City? He said, New York's a dangerous place, and I don't know if I'd want to be out on the streets at night, but I would do it with Cody. And I was like, yeah, I bet you that'd be something else. Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> well, New York I, is an amazing place. Oh, yeah. Well, I just want to touch real quick on your two books, and then I know you're extremely busy and you got to get going, but if you could just tell us a little bit about your two books, and then we'll let you get on your way. Yeah, my first book, 98.6 Degrees, Art of Keeping Your Ass Alive, is um, it was my first book in 2003, and um, it's basically wilderness survival skills, hypo and hyperthermia, desert and mountain survival. And my other book, uh, When All Hell Breaks Loose, is Urban Preparedness. That came out in 2006, and that's urban preparedness. And so they're very, very separate formats, separate intentions, but the overlap is pretty obvious as far as self-reliance. And um, they've been out, again, for many, many years. They're still selling very, very well. But I do like writing books, so I'm, I'm looking forward to putting out another book as soon as I can. Yeah, this sounds sound pretty awesome. So tell our listeners, um, if they want to find out more about your survival school and, and, and what you got going on, is there a website that they can go to? 
Yeah, the website is www.codylendine.com. That's spelled C-O-D-Y-L-U-N-D-I-N.com. All right. Okay, excellent. Very cool. And I guess we'll end it with this is one passionate guy, one motivated guy, and if you had to say a couple things to our listeners to keep them going in life, what would those words of inspiration be? Follow your heart, because if you don't, no one's going to do it for you. Right on. Right on, brother. Amen to that. Well, yeah. Cody, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for your time, and, and I really enjoyed this uh, interview with you, and you know, I wish you the best of luck, and you know, I, I, I'm even thinking that I would want to try one of your uh, one of your training courses. Well, you know, there's there's sooner or later. I mean, there's courses that are aggressive and there's courses that are more mellow. So, uh, yeah, maybe we'll see you. Yeah, in I would start with the softer ones first <laughs> to get my uh, get my get my courage up. But uh, definitely, um, it, it is something I think that when you can face your fears and you can you know push through and realize that you can take care of yourself without all of these amenities that we have, um, there's something to be said about that. It changes you inside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Cody, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're such a busy guy, and I can't thank you enough. We really wanted to tap into your head, and now we think we got our answers. And Yeah, I can see us um, talking to you in the future. I really hope your next book comes out. It's great, and I'm going to pick up your other books and read them right away, because I'm an author myself. And actually, Garth is an author, too, so we really get into the literary mind. Cool. Okay, well you well you two take care. All right, thank you. Okay, so take care. Buddy. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Survival expert Cody London. We are absolutely thrilled to have him here. Hi, Cody. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, Kim. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do? Yeah, what I do is I teach modern survival skills, primitive living skills, urban preparedness, and even get into some homesteading, um, which they're all very different uh, formats of self reliance. I started my company in 1991. Um, in and around Prescott, Arizona. And so those are the, the four main genres of self-reliance that I cover. And most of this is in hands-on courses out in the field or at my homestead. Cool. And you know what? I, I mean, I was on your website. You have an incredible website, uh, www.codylondon, so it's L-U-N-D-I-N dot com. And you can take classes. You've got books. You've got just a plethora of media events you've attended. How did this all get started for you? It got started by just having a personal passion in the late 1980s. In this business, like no one really wanted to have anything to do with you. You had to really, you know, rough it out and tough it out. It, that's true. I mean, now if it, the self-reliance thing is hot. I mean, if you th- if you really think about the context of what was going on here, there were no cell phones for civilians. You know, email was just starting to maybe happen. And and you, pretty much everything was a uh, written brochure, you know, or flyer or whatever. There was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. And that's a, what a lot of people exploit now, and it's unfortunate in a way because you can look like a badass with this um, uh, social media and really not have the background experience at all, but you can appear like you do. So this was a piecemeal, uh, I love what I do. So it's not like it was a, a really a chore to do this. I mean, both of you, if you're following your passion, you know it's never work to follow your passion, but it does take time to get established because what I do for a living involves whether you live or die in the wilderness. So it's a, it's a, mm-hmm. a profession I take very, very seriously, um, but it, for me, that's how it happened. It was a long road. It wasn't hip. You know, there weren't any television shows really on survival, and no one really gave a damn except a few people that took courses. There were schools before me, uh, by no means the first, but it's nowhere near the craze you know, that happened in Y2. I'm for, I'm fairly conservative with what I do because it's my job to be conservative with people in the field because I teach real people real skills, you know, to handle real situations. And so, you know, media does their thing, and God knows I've seen a lot of media. But, you know, my main passion is dealing, you know, with real people that, that really want to know the skills 
it might get compromised. It might get lost on a simple day hike, or we might have that next tornado, or whatever it might be that mm-hmm. knocks out the grid or, or knocks out them in the field carrying their backpack. And that's really, you know, uh, what it's all about for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I saw, I also saw another video clip of you where you actually took a, a, a news report to a supermarket, and I was actually, you know, when you picked up the can of tuna, uh, and the guy said, "What about can opener?" And he's like, "Oh no, you don't, you don't need a can opener. I'm going to show you how to open it." And you actually rubbed it against um, some concrete, and you know, the lid came right off. I I, I, I would have never thought of that. Yeah, it's, uh, that's the way those cans are made. And that was in 2006, and that was a book tour when I was in Seattle, Washington, for my second book, When All Hell Breaks Loose, Stuff You Need to Survive When Disaster Strikes. And that, mm-hmm. this is what I'm talking about. Is Seattle, because they're in such a, frankly, a dangerous geographic place, is when I first formally started teaching. And then I had a, 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 a girlfriend years ago that I put out a, basically an, an, an ad to the summer camps. Prescott, Arizona has a lot of different summer camps for kids, and I wrote every one of them, about, excuse me, about 20 of them, and said, hey, uh, my name is Cody, here's what I do. I can teach primitive skills or survival skills to the kids. And no one gave a damn. I didn't get one response out of like 20 letters. And she said, basically, stop your bitching. And she had a graphic designer friend in, in San Francisco, and they made me a free flyer. And uh, keep in mind, this was, you know, 1990 or so. <laughs> and I hung those around town on telephone poles and on store windows, which sometimes I still do. I'll, I don't do the telephone poles anymore. That's how it started. So basically, uh, no one else would hire me. And so I went self-employed uh, with my with my company. And that's literally how it started. It was very piecemeal. It's taken many, many, many years. But over the years, that's why you see all that media. It's been over two decades. Wow, that's 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 amazing. You know, it's, leave it to girlfriends to tell you what to do, right? Exactly. <laughs> get you get you straight. So so you're saying that you basically, you know, when you you started out okay, and with nine eleven, etc. Yeah, well, I can I can tell you that uh, you're definitely someone I would uh, want to be stuck out in the wilderness with. That's, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> are you are you asking me out? <laughs> 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 yeah, why not? I, I, if I were going to be stuck someplace, I, 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 I wouldn't mind being stuck with you because I've seen some of the things that you do, and you know, um, and it's just incredible. Uh, and, and, and you do have a passion for what you do. Um, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, I, I saw a video of you uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, you were you were out in uh, I think it was South Africa, and you fell into the water with a bunch of sharks. And I was like, Are you kidding me? There's absolutely no way I would do that. I would, I would freak out and panic. And I'm, well, you know, I'm, you know what? Actually, Garth actually called me after watching that video clip and said his heart was racing. He's like, my heart is actually racing after watching that clip. And he, he emailed it to me and said, you got to watch this clip. It is scary as hell. Well, you know, you need to remember that production is production. And, yeah, we do some sketchy stuff for sure. But that's not what you'd want to do for real. You know, you don't want to push the envelope. You don't want to be reckless and dangerous if you're in an actual survival situation for obvious mm-hmm. reasons. So, 